Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, Season 4, our debut episode. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the food professor, Sylvain Charlebois. It's great to be back on the mic after our Seattle bonus episode summer. Uh, you may hear some sound in the background, a little bit of Eagles playing right now. I'm coming to you live from Las Vegas at a conference called Grocery Shop. Uh, how was your summer? I Viva saw you- Las Vegas! Viva Las Vegas, baby! We can hear in the background some music, so it seems like you're having a good time there. <laughs> it, would, it would seem so. It would seem so. <laughs> we're, in, we're in the Vantage podcast studio that we set up on the beach uh, to do our interviews, which, uh, which is a pile of fun. Tough so- life. Tough yeah, life. It's not bad. It's not bad, actually. Now, yeah. I saw you... I was going to say I was your summer, but I must have seen you a hundred times on television. I didn't feel like you had a, react, a, a, a restful summer um but how was your summer you tell me oh my summer was busy um it was uh, really strange i was hoping to rest a little bit but mm-hmm. uh we we do uh, we do have a lot of work at the lab uh, lots of projects mm-hmm. uh, it's great but uh right now we we actually have 17 people on payroll uh supporting wow. different projects so it's it's busy it's busy meetings uh, every week and mm-hmm. uh uh, so we're looking at uh, salmon fishing, we're looking at uh, local foods, we're looking at farmer's markets, we're looking at uh, forecasting, we're wow. looking, and of course we're prepping our uh, our Canada's Food Price Report, yeah, our 14th edition, which will be released on December 5th. We're actually looking also, uh, we're working with uh, different groups uh, uh, across the country. So it's been really uh, a busy summer, and I'm hoping that over the holidays, we'll get some rest. But, you know, since COVID, I don't know about you, Michael, but since COVID, uh, summers are a little different. Well, I busy. mean, it was, it was a busy summer for me. I was in New York and it was in Orlando. Yeah, I so know. I did some I did some travel and did some vacation stuff, too. And uh, But I did some work as well. I mean, it was funny. I, I went to conferences in, in mid-July and the end of July, first day of August. And I'm like, who goes to conferences? But it, they were both sold out. So I think... You know what? I, my interpretation is a lot of people trying to figure out, get a handle on what's happening, right? Very dynamic environment. Yep. Grocery in all environments, right? The cu- customers changing, the environments changing. We've got to spend some time, kind of getting used to it. Now, you and I had actually planned to be together, and we actually did a post on LinkedIn together in person in Halifax last week. But events transpired against us. But we are going to be live together, uh, yes. p- podcasting from the Coffee Association of Canada's annual conference again our second time there what's called the i think it's called the road ahead november 9th uh we'll yep. put a link in the show notes so uh, run don't walk we'll do some great uh, great roster speakers so we're going to do our our interviews now this episode is a, a catch-up episode so we don't have a guest this episode but we will resume having guests uh starting uh in our future episodes we've got some great guests uh lined up yep Talking about catch up, I mean, there's been, there's so much going on. Oh, where do we start? Oh my God! Well, I, I you know, I'm, I'm I'm looking at where we start, and and I tell you, I did have this scripted out last week, you know, because there's a lot to talk about, and then our prime minister changed everything, summoning the big five to Ottawa, the closed door meetings, and you were there. Now, the whole thing yep. felt very performative to me like last week it's like i i summon the be in my office on monday like the principal's office or something like it seemed very performative i think it started from whatever intentions about hey let's let's work together to solve problems but you were there yep. uh you probably mm-hmm. can't share confidence it's a closed door meeting i've seen some stuff you've said in the media but take us give us a bit of context first of all how did you wind up in this mix and then you know what can you share about the meeting that that we don't already know? What's your perspective? Well, so I'll basically tell you the story as to why the meeting actually happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. Uh, So back in July, I was at the cottage and uh, I got a phone call out of the blue and it was Minister Champagne himself. Uh Yeah, he he called me and said, listen, uh, Sylvain. Did you know know him before he called you? Have you talked to him before? No, 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 not at all. Uh, he knew of me, sure, and sure. Uh, so he just called me up. So I know your work; it's great stuff that you do. Uh, I know you do a lot of work on pricing and forecasting and and inflation, but uh, I need your advice. Uh, France is about to freeze the price uh, for five thousand food products. Mm. Should we do this in Canada? Mm. So, so, so let me, me let me stop the you there. Is that France? Government was going to mandate the grocers, Carrefour, whoever, to freeze prices. Is that what you're saying? It was. It wasn't mandated. So Le Maire, the minister of the economy in France, basically called everyone in the same room 
starting with manufacturers to uh, get industry to freeze prices essentially. So it's not mandated, uh, industry complied essentially okay. for a while. Okay. And so he was asking me whether or not it would be a good idea to do that in Canada. And, I, and I'm sure you know how I responded. Yeah. I said, I yeah. don't think it's a good idea. And uh, so we chatted and uh, he did call me a couple of times uh, in August and uh, we chatted some more. But two weeks before uh, the fall session started, which was this Monday, he calls me. Uh, I was. I remember. I was actually walking to uh, the parking lot on campus uh, to get into the car, and he said, "Well, by next Thursday, which was when Prime Minister Trudeau said we're we're actually getting the Big Five in Ottawa, by next Thursday, if you were me, what would you do?" Huh. And I said, "Well." If you absolutely need to do something, if you absolutely need to do something, and I knew, I knew I was talking to a minister under a lot of pressure. Yeah, Polls yeah. are down, and he's not the minister of agriculture. To be clear, for the listeners, what he's the minister and, minister of and, industry of innovation. I'll innovation. get to that okay. in a second. Okay. It's a really important point that you're raising there. And so he said, "What would you do?" I said, "Well, if you absolutely need to do something, an actionable thing, just call a meeting. Hmm. Hmm. Call a meeting with the big five and see what happens, you're going to get some attention. You're going to, you're going to look like a minister who cares about inflation. And uh, and that's how it happened, hmm. basically. And so I... I it felt like it so, spun a little bit more than that, because the Prime Minister came out with some pretty performative stuff around... Well, so that, you know, was, I, that was the Friday before uh, okay. uh, Prime Minister Trudeau announced okay. that the meeting was going to happen. So on Thursday, he makes the announcements I knew was coming... What I didn't know was that he would say he basically threatened yeah. <laughs> the big five yeah. uh, if they didn't comply to some sort of plan. So that I didn't know that, but mm. he did say that. My guess is that the PM, the PM just wanted to give his minister a stick, basically. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so on Friday, for, of course, I did. Uh, Mr. Champagne did ask me if I am calling a meeting, would you come? And I said, yes, I would come. Uh, mm -hmm. I would, I would support you, and no problem. I can, I can brief you. I can provide you some with some insights, whatever you need. And uh, I'm not, I'm not paid. Uh, this is just voluntary work. I just, uh, I public any service. Government it's really that calls public service. I, I call that public service, right? The, the government. It's public service. It yeah. doesn't matter who's in power. I, I, I sure. think it's important for us to actually engage with politicians to help them. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And so, uh, so over the weekend, of course, things were being planned, and I was the first one to know. And uh, I was getting calls from. Uh, from different companies, they had no clue this was coming. No. Zero clue. Wow. They were they were learning this on Thursday, and on Friday, I I was trying to get some phone calls from different groups. I won't tell you who, but lots of I, no. I just basically <laughs> spent the whole day on the phone. Sure, sure. And uh, you can feel that the the industry was panicking, and then of course they realized that I was actually going to be part of this, mm -hmm. and so. I'm sure they understood that uh, I was in a rough spot because I'm here to help the minister, but at the same time, yeah. he's under pressure to deliver something. Well, you, you, you like them were summoned. I mean, <laughs> you know, I was summoned, absolutely, right? of course, uh, but for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so uh, the big five uh, came, and so the way things worked on Monday which was really interesting. So I was escorted from my hotel hmm. uh, at nine o'clock to uh, another hotel to meet Mr. Champagne and his team. Hmm. Uh, not in the building where the meeting was gonna be held. Okay. What they wanted to do was to uh, save me from the media yeah. uh, zoo. I mean, there was so much media. Oh yeah. my God. Well, it was just You know, when zoo. the prime minister makes a request like that, that gets a lot of people's attention, so, right? So they just wanted me to avoid the zoo, which yeah. I'm very thankful for. And uh, I got into the building from 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 the side, essentially. It's the CDL building in Ottawa. Yeah, You're know. from Ottawa, yeah, so yeah, you know, know where it is. Yeah. And so I got in uh, at 9.30, 9.45. 
Uh, I was with the minister for an hour and a half, like an hour and 15 minutes to prepare, to prepare him, prepare his team. The chair of the parliamentary committee was there. Many MPs were there. The deputy was there. A couple of ADMs. We, there was about 15 people in the room. So I was basically talking to the minister in terms of hmm. what my expectations are, what I was actually, what I intended to say yeah. to the big five. Okay. And I did tell him that I was going to uh, make a case for uh, for uh, for the fact that I don't believe that there is profiteering going on. It's important to say that. It's mm. important to present the facts to them. Facts, uh, facts, are, to, important. facts are important. Facts are important. And I wanted because I wanted the minister and the COs to li- to hear my my message at the same time. So yeah. so everyone can pivot and focus on what really matters. And so we got into the room. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Finland was there, so mm-hmm. uh, so I said hello. She provided some opening remarks. She left, and then Champagne took over, and mm-hmm. then I was asked to present for about 20 minutes or so. And so I basically focused on food inflation, why are we here. Uh, it's not the grocer's fault, but stuff happens, and basically kind of build a case for the problem but essentially the real problem i think for all of us was consumer trust i mean 82 yeah, percent of canadians actually believe mm. actually believe that greed is behind higher food prices that's a big problem yeah. uh, it's a big problem for grocers and they know that and yeah. so we went through some of the things that perhaps should could be addressed and, but i did actually went through things like the snack tax, uh, the carbon pricing policy, some of the things that the government is responsible for. Hmm. So kind of throwing a bone to grocers so they can actually have a dialogue with government saying, you know what, why don't we actually partner and try to figure out ways to make food more affordable. It's not just because of us or it's not just about us. It's about this uh, policy strategy combination that we have here. Interesting. And and so you went into the meeting with some sort of expectation of outcome. Uh, I mean, there was kind of a imperative placed in front of all of you, which was a plan for or by Thanksgiving. Like there is a deliverable yep. out of all this, not just another discussion. So yep. versus your expectations, and again, what you can and cannot share is a closed door meeting. But what, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, a lot of very important people, who run big, important companies that employ hundreds of thousands of Canadians all got together in a room and talked about an important issue. So what's your net net outcome in terms of good, you know, was it a great, was it a good meeting? Was it a productive time? And do you think, you know, there's a, there's a, the mandate there, there's going to be some, some outcomes. I think the meeting went as good as it could have, to be honest. Okay. I mean, I walk, when I walked in, CEOs were there uh, for a while. They were probably there for at least 10 minutes and nobody was talking to each other. Hmm. It was it was awkward. Yeah, it, it was awkward, and I felt awkward too because and they were all there in person, I, right? They were all because they others, were all there. Yeah, yeah. And frankly, Michael, I don't think it has ever happened before. Like, well, how many times have you seen the head of Walmart, Costco, uh, Canada, uh, Loblaws, Sobeys, and Metro all in the same room physically at the same time? I, I can't recall it. Doesn't happen uh, very it often. Ever ever to happen yeah. before? So. Yeah. That in and of itself, and I did say to Mister, just doing that is a lot. Yeah. I, I I think it's great that you got all five in there. So they take they they showed respect. Mm. Uh, they uh, they're they're playing along. They understood. I mean, they all understood why they were there. It wasn't about economics. It was all about politics. So they mm. got it. But uh, I actually felt that the meeting was constructive. I think we'll actually end up with a plan, uh, whatever plan that is going to be. Uh, I don't think it's going to be uh, uh, like a forceful, uh, "I'll dare you" sort of plan. I don't mm. think it's going to be that at all. I think, I mean, Mr. Champagne is is an action oriented guy, mm. but uh, he's also he's also after compromises, and mm. he's also tr- he's also he's always trying to understand. Uh, he, he that's his style with telecoms. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and to your point about the fact that he's not the minister of ag, this is this is really interesting because mm-hmm. my world or our world is ag, and ag moves 
at a at very a slow pace. At a certain pace. pace. Yeah, yeah. And all of the, everything's about Farmgate. Everything's about Farmgate. Not Monday. Monday was all about the consumer. Hmm. It was all about the consumer, consumer, consumer. And it was, was about actions like now. Yeah. Not the code. Not something in three years from now. Actions now. And frankly, it's... I felt it was a bit refreshing, to be honest. Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to hear all this that uh, you came out of that uh, with that perspective. Now, I, I guess one clarifying question. I mean, there's a, a plan to be put forward or a plan to come together. Now, unlike the, you know, the, the unlike the code of conduct, they're not all getting together and their associations getting together. It's an individual to put a plan in place. Like, how does it? How? Where was it left? I guess if you can share, where was it left? What do you, what's going to happen? Uh, so I, I, I have to be careful here. There are things that I want I would want a minister to uh, sure, put sure. forward himself. What I can say, you know, if you can't say, what I can say. say is that there'll be other meetings. Uh, there'll be other individual meetings okay. with grocers, and there'll also be meetings with. Uh, I recommended that minister meets with uh, with manufacturers as well. Okay. That's important, and, and, and did you- I think it's going to happen. Well, I was going to say, we haven't even talked about the manufacturers in this. And, and uh, then I was going to say, it's important to get them on the podcast, of course. <laughs> hey! <laughs> exactly. Minister, oh, you, yeah. you know, but it, come it, on the it, podcast it, it, and uh, It tells yourself. you where, where Ag Canada fits uh, in, in the pecking order in Ottawa yeah. when, when the food inflation file is given to the Minister of Innovation. Yeah, I got to tell you. Interesting point. Now, yeah. Um, Let's shift gears a little bit and uh, let's talk about food inflation. So you actually uh, posted on on social media a bit of positive news around, so to speak, around inflation. I think it was for the month of August, 6.8%. Um, how are you thinking about, as you said at the, off the top, you're working on, the, on Canada's food price report, so you're, you're no doubt deep into the forecasting part. But you seem to have a little bit of optimism that, I don't know, the, the, the momentum is slowing. What's your perspective right now on food inflation? Well, actually, you know, I don't know if uh, if we're allowed to to feel positive about food inflation, yeah. but uh, I think we should. I mean, things are going in the right direction. In fact, going back to our discussion about Monday's meeting, if we are aiming at stabilizing food inflation, that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> this, despite Ottawa's intervention, I mean, actually, right now, the market the stabilized. Food inflation rate, mm. It went down to 6.8%. The only place in the G7 where uh, the food inflation rate is lower is where you are right now in the United States. After that, it's Canada. Mm. And the gap between food inflation and inflation is down to 2.8. And on, yeah, actually, yeah. on Monday, I said to the Big Five, do expect on Tuesday, which was the day after, to see that gap narrow. And that's a big deal for you guys. Mm. It's a big deal for the industry. And that's exactly what happened. It went down to 2.8%, which is almost half of mm. what it was before in yeah. July. Well, it's, an, so, it's important from a consumer confidence. As you said, again, off the top, the, the issue is um, what consumers think about how food inflation comes about and how it impacts Oh, yeah, them, right? absolutely. And, and when you look at food categories, only fish uh, got more expensive in yeah. August, uh, month to month. Uh, everything else, produce, bakery, dairy, meat, all cheaper. Oh, so, interesting. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's all good news. So I, I wrote a piece in the Toronto Sun today and uh, tomorrow in La Presse. And uh, it, it's kind of – so the, the title of my column in today's paper is uh, Chicken Little and Canada's <laughs> Food Inflation. Because you can't – you post on X, you post on LinkedIn good news about inflation. People want to don't want to hear it. They yeah. just say, oh, no, it's too expensive. It's expensive. Prices should drop. Well, if prices should drop – Canadians spend 10% of their budget on food, which is the sixth lowest percentage in the world. Oh. What else do you need? Yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Um, one more thing about food inflation. You, I saw the Bank of Canada made some claim that uh, a component of that inflation was the carbon tax, 0.15. And you, you, you challenged them to, uh, as, a, as a professor, show their work. Um, have you got any uh, indication of? Well, uh, I didn't want to challenge. I didn't challenge him. I just said, "Listen, I, I find it odd that the governor actually would state something like this." Which is, let's face it, the carbon taxing uh, policy in Canada is quite is is a bit controversial. And uh, if you actually come up with a coefficient like that, you may want to show the arithmetic behind 
behind the coefficient. It's like a student, and that's what it's like I a asked. students in one of your programs. It's like I love your I love your conclusion. That's interesting, but how did you get there, right? How did you yeah, get so there? I, I, I made there? the request, I think it was the day after mm. the claim was made by, by the governor, never got a reply, mm. not a reply. So I went on X and said, listen, uh, can we get yeah. something? Yeah. And of course, today I got an email oh. from the Bank of Canada. Oh. So they're looking into it, Okay. just okay. so you know. Man of action. <laughs> um, let's take let's take a step back and, and think about the overall state of the food and packaged good industry in Canada. So, uh, you know, before we went on uh, to our CL summer, uh, frozen pizza brand exited the market, uh, and then during the summer, uh, you know, we shed a few tears. Uh, it was a Kleenex decided they were pulling out and, you know, can't stand, you know, is this a can't stand the heat getting out of the proverbial kitchen? There were some op-eds that I just did, I thought were nonsense, but about why and, you know, there's ideas, you know, some of these associations. Oh, are, are you saying, uh, referring to the op-eds in the Globe and Mail? I, I might be. Um, oh my God. But I, thought, I thought it was just nonsense, but um, what, what's your take yeah, on Yeah, you know, there, there were a few brand. columns this summer that, uh, to be honest, uh, I, I think the Globe and Mail needs to do some fact checking here. I, like seriously, yeah. uh, come op-ed on. Op-ed doesn't mean, <laughs> anyway, but what's your, what's your take? I mean, it, to me, it was like a big corporation Make their fifteen twenty billion dollar Kimberly Clark makes a decision they're going to exit the market because whatever. Yep. Um, I you know to me it's just like the how competition works. But do you have any other take or do you have a different take or do you have the same take or what, you, what were you thinking? What were you thought? I honestly I can't really comment about the Kleenex situation because it's not it's not, not necessarily something I follow sure. very closely. It's Industry not street dynamics uh, though. I mean it's a lot moved through the yeah the, the Nestle know. exit though. I mean I I would say the this summer exit, the frozen uh, pizza exit. Yeah yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, I think the void is being filled by other products. Um, yeah. The the challenge, though, I, I, I and as you know, Michael, I've always been concerned about competitiveness in manufacturing in Canada. I actually do think that we need to make sure that uh, we take care of CPG companies. When you talk to CPG companies, they they it's tight. It's tight. It's hard for them to get go to head office and justify more investments in Canada, mm. be because of uh, some of the tightness. Uh, and I'm not sure you share that perspective but mm, crocodile a uh, little point. crocodile tears here 15 billion dollars well, you big can't company. get a kleenex anymore you can't get a kleenex <laughs> uh, i'm looking at one right now it might not be the same brand anyway <laughs> all right speaking of warm places frosty relations in a warm land uh asking for a friend how important is india to the ag sector in canada because yeah so china was off the list now india's off the list that's almost three billion people on earth we sell for about $12 billion worth of stuff to India a year. A lot of it is actually agri-food, including including fertilizers, lentils, um, pulses in general. So, yeah, it's a big deal. And, and frankly, the hurt will be felt in the prairies mostly. Uh, okay. Non-ag stuff would be uranium. Uh, sure, sure. And, and so... Yeah, the prairies will feel it. If something happens, uh, they would probably feel it. Uh, not necessarily central Canada or even here in the Atlantic, but uh, okay. again, when the Meng Wanzhou uh, uh, case uh, erupted uh, in Vancouver a few years ago, uh, within days, China actually basically issued an embargo on canola, Canadian yeah, yeah. canola. And again, the prairies were impacted. So mm-hmm. it's always, whenever there's there's some geopolitics going on. The prairies actually pay the price, yeah. unfortunately. So I, I, I'm I'm yeah. I'm very concerned about uh, okay. what's happening because India. We were actually looking. So right now, diplomatically, we halted negotiations for a, a trade agreement yeah. with China for yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah. And everyone thought, well, India's next, or the India Pacific uh, yeah. region is certainly key for our growth. And now. And now all of a sudden, within mm. one statement by the prime minister, everything is just or, or, put on the side. Or one action by the Indian government in murdering someone in Canada. So, uh, you know, I don't know all the details, but... Um, allegedly. Allegedly. But I don't think... I, I, listen, I, I, you know, listen, I'm not sure the prime minister of our country, whether you like him or not, would do something like that if he, you know, was pretty confident that there is an issue because it's... 
Anyway, it's complicated. It's well beyond the scope of this podcast. Oh, you know, it is. It is. I can't comment on the diplomatic no, no, no. part yeah, of yeah. this because yeah. it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. But I'm certainly concerned about how uh, this can really hurt our agri-food sector for sure over the long term. And we saw what happened with China a few years ago. Yeah. Atlantic and lobster. Co- and it does affect the Atlantic too, right? The lobster. The Atlantic industry, lobster yeah. as well. So, and uh, and a lot of people right now are concerned that this could actually happen again, but mm. with India. So unfortunately, whatever for whatever reason it happened. Yeah. Uh, again, I can't comment on what happened, but uh, in terms of, ag- of of agri-food and in our sector, that's it's just not good news. Uh, well, we'll keep a close eye on it. it's a developing story. Speaking of developing stories, let's uh, let's uh, I want to get an update from you on. Um the war in Ukraine and as Zelensky's in Washington, soon to be in Ottawa. Uh, what do you know about grain movements? Uh, there seem I, to be- I got to tell you, I mean, the summer was super surprising. I was absolutely flabbergasted when the Black Sea deal ended. No one panicked. Hmm. Hmm. No one panicked. So I thought, oh my God, the Black Deal is dead. Putin is walking away. We're going to see corn go up again. We're going to see wheat go up again. It went down. You know what that means, right? No. It what does means that, mean? that it means commodities are finding a way to the market mm-hmm. by train, by by a truck. They they figured out a way, and of course, there's China who needs grain, so they're not going to. They're not. They don't want to suffer as a result of of this invasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they'll make they'll make darn sure they have access to. To uh, to the commodities they they need mm. in order to feed their people, so I, I think the market really just figured it out uh, that Putin was just weaponizing the deal, not food. It was weaponizing the deal. Oh, interesting. And as soon as the deal was over, people just went on, and and nobody mm. really is talking about the deal. Mm. Another incident: rice in India. Right, right. Again, I thought, oh my god. Rice, rice, rice prices are going to go up. Yeah, I, th- People I, I, I thought it, I thought it was going to be the uh, the toilet paper. Remember the toilet paper at the beginning of COVID? I thought you know I better go better go stock up on uh, some beautiful basmati rice. rice but, yeah, um, and and of course there were there were there were reports of stockpiling here and there where. Uh, there's a big Indian community uh, in different parts of the country, yeah. uh, understandably so. But nobody panicked again. The price of rice prices remain pretty stable along the way. So, I'm 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 wondering whether or not uh, investors' markets are becoming much more resilient. Mature. Resilient? Man. Yeah, I was, I was going to use the word resilient. Right? It's like, okay, but, that's a big shock, but we we'll get through it. Is that? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, look at uh, I mean, uh, wheat is uh, six thirty a bushel or something, and mm. and so it's really things are really calm, and uh, and of course uh, Brazil is uh, Brazil is really taking advantage of the whole planet planet situation right now. There's lots of uncertainty with mm. the Americans. There's a drought going on there with Europe with Ukraine. Brazil is going through two harvests. It's selling a lot to China. It's thinking about not using the U.S. reserve, uh, their mm. U.S. Uh, dollar as a as a currency. You I talked mean, about that. You talked about that last season. Yeah, yeah. You, that's you're a- starting to feel that the ag world is starting to move away from the U.S. dollar a little bit, mm. and uh, and I think really, I mean, we're in the middle of the second Cold War, and uh, it's against it's it's U.S. against China. And nobody will know. Nobody knows who's going to win, and nobody knows how long it's going to last. But I can tell you, that Ukrainian war is not done. It's going to last a long time. Yeah, and, 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 and then uh, the repercussions. I was reading an article about uh, even if, even, you know, even if God willing, it ends, uh, and the Russians leave, they've sowed fields full of mines. So you know, yeah. it'll take years. A decade. I don't know. It, it reacts well, pretty fast. Maybe a decade. Ukrainians ag ag sector agriculture is basically exporting uh, less than half of mm. what it was exporting before the invasion. Yeah. So I'm, that's I'm, why Ukraine is becoming less significant. And so right now you got other players like Brazil picking up the pace, which is really interesting. So the market uh, market knows that, and uh, so it's looking at other places to get the food it needs which mm. is really interesting so mm. i'm 
That's why I'm less concerned about inflation now. I mean, I actually yeah, think that things are much more sober than mm. just last year. We were exiting COVID. People got nervous. Ukrainian, Ukraine gets invaded. People got nervous again. Not this year. Didn't mm. happen. Interesting. Uh, yep. Let's shift gears. Uh, let's talk about a couple of things left for us to talk about because uh, um, we got a whole season ahead of us. So, uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> got a whole season ahead of us to cover a whole bunch of stuff i wanted to touch on plastic and grocery stores so um oh yeah you know bags are gone but there's lots of plastic in grocery stores and and you had uh some thoughts around and as i had i around the this trade-off between food safety economics and and plastics environmental impact you know how do we balance these things in your minds you know balance food safety um and and what are our objectives here what what can be done uh, from a sustainability perspective, from a plastic perspective, and I got to tell you, I mean, I, I so the P two uh, notice actually came out in August, and they gave uh, industry like two days to respond. <laughs> I mean, in the middle of that's summer, reasonable. like that's reasonable. seriously, yeah, that's reasonable. We, so as a lab, we met E triple C twice during the consulting period. What's E triple C? What's E triple C for the Environment listeners? Climate Change Canada? Okay, and that's what. What is, what is that? The, tell me. Tell so us the, they're responsible for for this file. Okay. And so government, federal government, department. It's Environment Canada. I mean, okay. So uh, okay. it's basically yeah. It's it's uh, so they they're responsible for for P two and during our discussions, uh, the tone was not very open minded. Hmm. I mean, it was very let's just meet the guy, talk to him, and then move on. But Hmm. I gotta say, I mean, this science—it doesn't really matter. They don't—they don't seem to really uh, care about uh, food security, how it would impact prices uh, over the long term, how uh, produce, uh, the quality would be impacted, the fact that uh, our partners outside of Canada have no idea what's going on in Canada. Why would they actually comply to our rules when they can make actually money doing uh, selling produce elsewhere? Mm. There's no there's no real thinking about supply chain economics, about trades or anything like that um, because of food safety. Because of I mean, plastics are bad for the environment, but at the same time, they're good for food security. I mean, so we're addicted to plastics because. Plastics are, have been have, have served the sector so well and have served consumers so well. So to replace plastics is not an easy thing. Yeah, interesting. Well, we're keep, yeah. we'll keep an eye on it. Um, I want to so talk. But I, but I do think they'll bulldoze the 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 the, the P two uh, project forward. It is voluntary. It is voluntary. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, but the pressure they want to put pressure on grocers. That's again that's the grocers. The, that's, yeah. <laughs> It's a voluntary uh, approach, putting pressure on grocers so they can actually ask manufacturers and traders to comply to new rules. That's the strategy at ECCC. And I don't know if it's the right strategy or not, to be honest. Uh, let's talk about Omiel. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Because I have Holy a history. Holy Mel. Holy Mel. Uh, <laughs> holy sh. <laughs> uh, holy boo. All right, let's talk about that <laughs> Quebec uh, pork producing uh, company that we interviewed the president of Yannick oh, Gervais. Yes. Now, they, they, uh, they shut down a couple of plants, laid off 400 people, or at least transferred them around. First of all, what do you, uh, what do you make as just continued of what we've been seeing from Yannick, where he's kind of consolidating and getting the business in order? Any, any broader thoughts around it? Well, when Valais Auction closed in April, uh, and uh, and a thousand people would be laid off, uh, I merely said it's not over. There's going to be another one. Uh, so, another, overstretch. Another, another hoof to drop, so to speak. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, so I, I, I so when Paysville was announced a couple of weeks ago, I was not surprised at all. And um, mm. and frankly, I don't think they had much of a choice. So right now, since we we left for the summer, the governor of Quebec is buying out hog farmers. Mm. So if you're a hog farmer and you want out, you can actually have the government buy pay you oh, your way to buy you. Yeah, to buy you out. So that's that's one thing that they're doing right now. But Ali Mel has to recalibrate as well, for two reasons. One, you'll have less supply, and two. 
China doesn't want your product anymore. Yeah. So you got to, and, and that's a big that's chunk a big market. of the market. That's a big market. And so that's why I think we're just recalibrating. All email is doing what it's do. It's it needs to do in order yeah. to survive. And the other thing, of course, is this insurance policy called ASRA in Quebec. And this is something we haven't talked about, but mm. this is this has maintained Olimel artificially alive. It allowed Olimel to expand and log off farmers to survive. Uh, it's a program financed by taxpayers, the federal government, and the provincial government. If, if hog prices went uh, goes uh, would go underwater, farmers are compensated. So there's no incentive to leave if you, you're losing money. Huh? And so so there was no mechanism in place to uh, to basically keep hog farms out or in. And two, uh, if you're an organic farmer like Vincent, for example, mm-hmm. which we Bretton. had on the podcast, yeah. well, Bretton, he doesn't. Yeah. He 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 is he's not part of this system, and he, and and his product is not recognized by the regime. Uh, which I think is ridiculous because he's got a great product yeah. and he should be recognized by the regime over time. So right now, Quebec is going through this um, this uh, this this kind of review of how they should be supporting the hog industry, which is an important sector for, for the province. So yeah. interesting. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that, and I'm sure we'll have guests who will talk about that. I wanted to touch on something that was brought well, by up. By the way, oh, by ahead. the way, Michael, yeah, if yeah. you like bacon, yeah, if you like bacon, if you like pork, yes, which I do. Lots of deals for you. Mm, good. Lots news. of deals for you. Good news. <laughs> well, I do. I do like, uh, as listeners might know, uh, Dubreton because of, you know I like the uh, I like the animals to have a good life and one bad day. <laughs> so I am I am fussy about uh, the pork I buy from that perspective. That day happens to be the last one. It does. It does. Yeah, that's um, right. So there's an op-ed that uh, was published uh, by the uh, FHCP, and it talked about it just you know it explored a bunch of issues, and and I think some of it was the trigger of Kleenex, but there's the broader issues about um, the industry, and it said. Hey, listen, we got 40,000 open spots in manufacturing in this country. And one of the tactics was we need an increase in foreign temporary workers. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think we should be importing cheap talent versus what you've talked about, which is I think it suppresses investment in technology because it becomes a short-term fix. We're flying in talent. And I, I, I'd hate to see the industry kind of reflexively say, well, just get more foreign temporary workers because I don't want to spend any money. What are your what are your thoughts on that? In, you know, invest in technology uh, versus import cheap I, labor. I, I agree with you. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't really overly comfortable with that recommendation. I do think we need to, in 2023, we need to think differently about uh, human capital. We need to think differently about robotics and, and automation. Right. And frankly, I think companies like Aldi Mel are, are making that, that shift right now. They're keeping a couple of plants because they want to modernize those plants. Mm. And uh, that was what Maple Leaf did a few years ago. Um, it, to me, that recommendation just brings back the sector. I think it would have been nicer mm. to It doesn't to solve any at, problems. It doesn't, it doesn't solve anything. I mean, it's just a, exactly. it's a, it's yeah. a band-aid. But uh, I, I, I mean, next week, next week I'm in Montreal meeting some investors to talk about AI. I mean, uh, yeah. that's the future. Talking uh, about it here. They're what, talking about it here, man. Yeah, AI and uh, why? Why do we need to look at AI? And uh, it's yeah. it's all about efficiency, less waste, robotics, uh, more predictability, yeah. all the things that really has bothered us for many many years. And 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 foreign workers won't do that. Yeah, yeah. they just won't. Uh, let's shift a gear. I, I, I've used this a couple of times, but let's shift gears again. Uh, pretty close to the last time because we've we've had a great discussion. Uh, restaurants. Let's talk about restaurants. So. Restaurants Canada, they are ringing the alarm bells, uh, marching on Ottawa. I saw the president using using harsh language in the context of political language. A lot of people are using harsh language these days. (laughs) (laughs) So so they, they, uh, as an association representing uh, that industry, had been asking for relief on, on on the COVID funding the loans and they got an extension, but in, according to them, it fell well short. We've seen, I've seen other data uh, coming out that uh, spending in the restaurants has gone down, not up. Uh, so it's not growing. So it, it yeah. feels like a bit of double 
jeopardy here. Any any thoughts on what's going on in the in the restaurant industry? And and you know, it feels well, like I think feels, everyone is expect. Well, I think everyone is expecting a tough fall. So yeah. uh, so this is uh, again uh, the deal they made with Ottawa will only um, uh, just delay the inevitable. To be honest, mm-hmm. uh, and so I, I think I mean. The, the sector was talking about a great reset, or some people were ta- were talking about the great reset. It's it's, it's kind of happening. It, we're going through a mini great reset, if you will, because uh, a lot of restaurants are closed, are closing, they're leaving. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, somebody's buying Subway for nine point six billion dollars. Unbelievable! Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of that? On I was I mean I was I don't know. Where you know, in a sector that business has been in decline for years, I don't know what solution they're going to have to turn that business around. I think they're going to. Anyway, somebody, you know, you know, you ever heard of the bigger fool theory of finance? I mean, basically, your stocks, yes. right? There has to be a, if you're selling, there's got to be somebody more foolish than you to buy. So I, I, but I, I was, I was flabbergasted by the by the amount. I actually had no idea Subway was actually worth 9.6 billion U.S. dollars. No idea. I don't know, or or, or is it? I don't know. But I, I guess we wish. With, I, I tell you what, I mean, Subway with 25,000 outlets. Is probably worth nine point six billion dollars, but they have too many outlets. Well, I was going to say, yeah, assuming that twenty five thousand is the right number. I mean, that right number could be with more capacity, more revenues. You know, because right now, I mean, the whole the, the 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 obsession for many years was was about number of of outlets, and and they basically sold franchises to people who just wanted to buy a job, and yeah. it's hard to build a franchise system based on that well and and you start to have you know your zone of competition kind of collapse right so you got to you're building a subway inside a subway kind of thing in some states exactly subway and subway anyway we we wish them the best of luck another so many lawsuits so many you know there's there's been so many problems with it with our image and so uh hopefully things will work out for them because uh it is popular as you said a lot of people it's their life you know they retire and this is their job so there's a lot of livelihoods uh, at it's just the, the smell when you enter a subway. I don't know. I don't it's mind just... it. The fresh bread smell. I mean, really? No, I don't mind it. I don't mind no, subway. No, fresh cake. Fresh cake. Well, you see, cake. yeah, I know. That's Maybe that's why I don't, <laughs> I don't mind it. Uh, last but not least, let's end on a fun note. Did you notice the opening of a great new store, second one in the world, uh, the Fantastic World of Portuguese Sardine Store? Did you see this opening up in Times Square? I did not. I wonder why you're so interested in Portuguese uh, cuisine. As, as it happens, I, you know, uh, I love Portuguese <laughs> cuisine like I love my wife. Uh, but I know. Have you I heard know. of this store? So it's, there's, there was one in Lisbon. In fact, uh, the woman we had from the Portuguese uh, Association we interviewed over Seattle and I talked about yep. it, how sardines are the newest thing. So you, it's a store that has walls and walls and walls of bespoke canned sardines. And it's now really? got a giant store in Times Square, like right beside the Hershey store, right beside the M&M store, the fantastic world of Portuguese sardines. So anybody heading to New York, uh, go to Times Square and visit that store. I'm going to go. I'm going to be in New York. It's close to the weeks. M&M store on yes. Times Square? I was actually there last year. Yeah, it just opened. It That's opened. a busy place. It's a busy place. It just opened uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'm going. Wow. Apparently, now I'll validate this in person. Apparently, you can get a sardine can from the year you were born. Um, <laughs> Sounds fishy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Boom. Boom. <laughs> Let's. Uh, all right. Well, listen. But let's, I'm intrigued. Uh, What's so interesting about sardines? Like, uh, you got to tell me here. They're, they're having a moment. Like canned sardines, bespoke canned sardines are having a moment. Uh, I'm serving them up as an appy on on uh, on little cream cheese, and people have gone from the plain old, you know, sardines in a tin to these bespoke with sauces in it. You and I have had some from uh, from Scout, yep. which is a great Atlantic. That's uh, right. Yeah. Company. Um, yeah. And, and so they're having a moment. Sardines, canned sardines are having a moment. This is kind of crystallizing that. Um, sardines you know the spanish guys i was in i was in spain and i bought when i got back here it's like they're they're bespoke sardines and and they're delicious so you know there you go 
Um, That's true. Wow, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Yeah. Well, I will, I, and I, and I, honestly, I, I had no idea that sardines are a big thing in Portugal. <laughs> yeah. Very big, very big. All right, well, listen, this has been a great episode, our first one. It's great to be back on the mic with you. I've missed you. Uh, we've talked a little bit, but it's I great to be back I, on the ne- mic. Next year, we shouldn't actually stop for three months. We should actually do uh, do a show early September, I think. Yeah, well, you know, listen, yeah. uh, who knew there'd be so much activity? But I don't think it's going to slow down. Uh, so I think that's a great point. Uh, but yeah. anyway, we'll be together again at the uh, Coffee Association in Toronto. We'll be doing some interviews, and we'll be together in person. And then, uh, you know, we're back each and every week. So, listen, if you're uh, if you're listening to us on a podcast channel... Thank you. Uh, follow or subscribe. Uh, share with your friends in the restaurant, food service, uh, grocery industry, uh, so they can uh, they can listen in too. And and uh, from now on, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, Sylvain, safe travels. Uh, I'm traveling myself tomorrow, and and be around. But safe travels to you. And and thanks for joining me on the mic again. All right. You take care, Michael. <laughs>